Hey everyone, I'm Jennifer, the Center for Asian American Media's Membership Manager, and on behalf of everyone at CAM, thank you for joining us at today's member event, Getting Real with acclaimed filmmaker, Diane Borchez. It's so wonderful to see so many of our wonderful members, supporters, filmmaker partners, and new friends and faces um, with us today. If you aren't currently a CAM member, I hope you'll consider joining at our website, cammedia.org, or by contacting me after today's program for more information. In addition to supporting CAM's critical year-round work with our community storytellers, you'll also, members receive uh, invitations to programs like this, as well as exclusive access to our upcoming fall festival, CAM Fest Forward. Before I before we start, um, I'd also like to acknowledge some of the key folks who have made today's program possible. They are, of course, Diane borche lean thank you so much, uh, Stephen Gong, Francis Pomperata, Crystal Fernandez, Joanna Chin, uh, Jonathan Shea, Misashi Nwano, and Jeremy Corral. And with that, I'd thrilled to introduce CAM's Festival and Exhibitions Director, Masashi Nuano. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jen, and everyone for putting this together. I, I am so happy to be here. Um, nice to be here virtually with everybody. Um, I am smiling a lot for two reasons. Um, number one, um, I see the uh, sun coming through the clouds for the first time in many days. I don't know how long it's going to last, but I'm enjoying that. I'm also just so thrilled to be here to celebrate Deanne as a filmmaker. I tell people all the time that Deanne is one of the most influential filmmakers on me personally, um, and it's um, and I'm so proud of that. Um, I actually started at CAM about 15 years ago when I was at SS State, and I was an intern, and 
I had amazing CAM staff and professors showing me films like First Person Plural and other Asian American documentaries that that impacted me so much and really changed my course from being an aspiring filmmaker to working with organizations like CAM that continue to support and celebrate films um, uh, like First Person Plural and for filmmakers like Deanne. So I am here to talk a little bit about CAM Fest Forward. Um, we did a festival in May. I hope you all participated, but there are still so many amazing things, uh, films and um, exciting kind of programmatic elements that we wanted to do in 2020. So uh, Camp Fest Forward is that opportunity. We're thrilled about our uh, lineup of films and events. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You know, when you look at virtual festivals or different ways that people are doing things, uh, for us, we have three unique paths uh, for you all to experience um, amazing Asian American cinema with us. First off, uh, we have our drive-in experiences. Um, next, we have scheduled programs. And lastly, something we call Camp Fest On Demand. So uh, first off, our drive-ins, we have two nights at a local drive-in um, where we'll be celebrating some amazing films. Um, it'll be a mixture of local films, um, films by auteur filmmakers, um, and also uh, two world premieres. So. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, capacity is limited, so if you are interested, please buy your tickets early. Um, members do get a discounted rate. Um, secondly, we have our scheduled program. So for anyone who participated in our May Heritage at Home Festival, everything there was scheduled. It is like a, well, like a regular film festival where we come together to celebrate something together and have that dialogue, celebrate that film together. We will have many of those upcoming. Um, this will be a mixture of film screenings, live conversations. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. Some will be ticketed and some will be free for the community. Um, our last programmatic element is CamFest On Demand. This is a newer um, uh, platform for us or opportunity. We're thrilled about it. We'll have over 40 films, um, over 15 feature films and many shorts. Um, all available between day one and the last day of our festival, um, October 14th through the 18th. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a pass for it. Again, members get a discounted rate. I think you're seeing a trend for our member benefits. Um, but uh, that pass will get you access to uh, all of the films in our on demand. Um, one thing I wanted to tell you all and to reveal is our opening night film. It is Coming Home Again. This is a film, if you've been part of the CAMP family for the last year or two, you might have heard about it. This is our partnership and uh, collaboration with director Wayne Wang. Um, this is a CAMP production that we filmed uh, about two years ago. Um, it premiered at TIFF and played at the Busan um, International Film Fest as well. So we are bringing this film back to the Bay Area. It stars Justin Chan and Jackie Chung and is based off a New York essay by Chan Ray Lee. And Chan Ray Lee co-wrote this script of this film with Wayne Wang. So um, you'll learn much more about the film very soon. It's a very powerful film about a son who comes home and prepares this amazing uh, traditional Korean New Year's Eve dinner for his family. And through that day that he's prepping all this food, you learn about the family, you learn about the mother who is dealing with cancer. Um, so many things happen in the film that, um, yeah, I, I'm excited. I think it's ready. We're so ready for you all to see this amazing film. But that's it. I, I will say in about a week, we will be revealing all of our films and lineup. Members will be first to learn about our programs. Um, but I'm excited. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all this October at our festival. Um, and yeah, I'm going to send this off now to my boss, uh, the executive director of CAM. Please help me welcome Stephen Gong. <laughs> ah, hi everyone. Thanks a lot, Masashi. It's well known among the staff that I'm a little bit slow on the uh, on hitting the right button. So I hope you can all see me. Um, you know, as uh, and thanks to Jen also. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention a few things about this extraordinary year we've been in: um, the pandemic, the racial reckoning, the fires, the smoke, 
the fear, the uncertainty, uh, but also storytelling and also community and also moments when we realize how we are all connected with one another. And uh, we at CAM, despite you know, all of this uncertainty, and all of the hardship and suffering that we uh, see around us. We are an immensely grateful to those you know, who put their lives uh, at risk each and every day to make sure our, uh, our, our community uh, moves forward. And we are grateful to have our work uh, to hold community together through storytelling, uh, through the pre presentation of programs like this. Uh, we thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I wish you the very best, keeping your family safe, um, doing all of the work that we can so that we can emerge uh, better and create a better society. So thank you all. So as we've mentioned, you uh, shouldn't be a surprise, you know, this is the 40th anniversary of CAM. Uh, and the year we envisioned when we started, uh, was going to be for a very different year. Uh, uh, we've had to adjust, uh, as I'm sure you and all of your families have. But in spite of all of that, you know, uh, I think in many ways, the whole campaign that we had envisioned of Camp Forward is more important than ever. I think we have to, um, even as we celebrate some aspects of the past. And today's program is clearly a celebration of one of our most acclaimed filmmakers. Uh, I think we're all looking ahead. And I know Deanne is as well. And I think what I'm reminded of is um, the work, the, the journey continues. There are so many more stories to tell. We are heartened by the next generation. I think we've all seen that, uh, the possibilities to finally confront some of the uh, worst uh, inequities and disparities in our, uh, in our society um, belong in the hands of the next generation. So let's uh, start this. And if you, if you can do your part by continuing to join our programs, to share these amazing stories with your friends and family, and uh, let's educate the next uh, generation to seek uh, more, greater equity and greater inclusion. So uh, of the different, of the many different films that we could pick to celebrate uh, Cam's 40th anniversary, the first one that came to my mind is, uh, is to have this kind of conversation with Deanne because Deanne is a friend. So in the chat, there will be more information, you know, that I might have that they'll, that our team will fill in on how you can um, connect and watch and learn more about Deanne's films. But let's get to it. I don't want to delay any longer. Deanne is someone that I've admired for a long time, as I've mentioned. I've looked forward to this conversation. So we'll talk today about uh, her work as a filmmaker and, um, and we'll, we'll look into issues like identity, perspective, point of view, history, memory, you know, lots of good subjects. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Deanne Borchelin. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Deanne. How are you? How are you? Young as ever. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Stephen, for inviting me here today. And um, thanks to all of you who are joining um, from various cities. It's um, great to be here. I know it's a really challenging time. And um, I appreciate uh, you all making you know time to be together. Um, and and Stephen, if I can say just congratulations to CAM on its 40th anniversary. Uh, you know, I worked at CAM as you know from for like 10 years, from I think 1986 to maybe 96 or 97. And um, the organization has just done amazing work um, and accomplished so much in 40 years. And um, I particularly appreciate uh, this year, you know, as we go through all of the challenges that you've done so much to keep us connected and to um, amplify Asian American stories and voices. And particular congratulations on the Asian American series. 
um, you know, we talked about doing a series for years, for decades, and um, you, you all pulled it off with an amazing team. Um, so congratulations. Thank you very much, Deanne. Um, I've joked with you a lot about the, the your, uh, your, your switch to becoming a filmmaker uh, cost us a, an incredible career as probably one of the finest arts administrators we could have had. And I wished in many ways that you had stayed director of, of uh, NATA for another decade or so, but uh, I understand. And, and it turns out it was a really amazing and good choice. So let's get right to that conversation. You know, first person plural, and I, I just did want to start. It was amazing to kind of have a front row seat because when I met you, you had not really started, you know, down this path and just getting to know you a little bit better. And I remember you saying, you know, you're going to go home to visit your family in Fremont. And, you know, you started to, to share some of that stuff with us. So I know it's an amazing journey. And, and we've all seen this now through um, the two films. Uh, we understand more deeply. But one of the things I wanted to start with was, you know, just, just how... What, was it a particular moment when you sort of understood uh, this, I need, that, that, I'm, that I need to undertake this personal search and now I need to make it into a film? What was that, what was that process like for you? And, and or, or did it evolve even over time? But you know, what, what about, were you documenting at first or did you always know there's a film here? Mm. You know, um... When I arrived at NATA, I think it was, was the idea that, that I was very interested in filmmaking. I, at the time, I was pursuing a PhD in uh, psychology and um, was working on trying to get a dissertation started and um, decided that rather than getting a PhD, that I should follow my heart, which was really uh, filmmaking. And um, I, you know, I, I feel so much gratitude to the community that was then NATA. Um, you know, people like Jim Yi and Janice Sakamoto, our beloved friends, who were the first to really um, uh, support my aspiration to make a film and to tell this story and, you know, that I shared the idea with from the very beginning. And um, other people who were um, early, you know, in, involved early in the years of NATA, including Mike Chin and um, Spencer Nakasako, uh, Debbie Lum, Scott Sujitani, David Liu, um, and of course, you know, Vivian Hillgrove, who ended up uh, uh, working with me for many months in, in editing the film. Um, so I, I feel like the support that I had at, at NATA, at CAM, was, um, was really instrumental in, um, in helping to get the film launched. Um, you know, Maya Angelou once said that um, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. And I think um, that sentiment really describes my state of mind and my heart um, leading up to making first person plural. Um, I think I was compelled to explore what happened to my life as a matter of survival um, and to really interrogate kind of the, the truth um, that was thrust upon me um, through adoption agency records, through legal documents, and really my own parents' um, narration of my adoption story. And so I think there was a, a, a certain point uh, around the time that I arrived at NATA um, that I came to realize that all of these mechanisms um, had uh, led to kind of the erasure of my history and my identity and actually even my memory. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I was eight years old when I was adopted and um, developed almost complete amnesia about my history and identity to the point where I think if my birth mother walked in front of me um, on the street somewhere, I would not have recognized her. And um, so I think, you know, working on first person plural in some ways, I think was also a struggle to reclaim my memory. Um, and uh, as one of my favorite authors, uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, uh, describes, the, the struggle for memory, I think, is very much linked to a struggle for voice and self-determination and control. And um, so I think in many ways, 
uh, in retrospect, you know, making first person plural, and the whole process of encountering my family, um, looking at all of my documents, visiting the orphanage, I think all of that was in part a struggle to struggle for voice and also for control of my own life story. Um, yeah. Let's, you know, if we can, let's take a uh, look at a couple of the images from first person plural just to remind uh, our viewers of, and one of the photos, the one on the left, you know, is of your first uh, night, right, here in America, right at the point of your adoption. That's your adoptive mom, Alvine uh, Borche, and on the right is your Korean family. Okay, so one of the things, yeah, this is remarkable, Dan, the, the notion, I, it's a chilling moment in a way about you, you're relating the story of, uh, I think you were in college, right? You had just started to move away and starting to have your own memories and this voice returning to you. So yes, the loss of memory, the, the, the placement of images, I think it becomes so central. It's like this amazing detective mystery, you know, uh, and, and that we see really borne out in uh, Matter of Cha Chang Yi. Um, one of the things that I think remi I remark on or I think about in first person plural, it is the most amazing use of home movie footage that I think I've seen in any film. You know, you know, I'm a real uh, archival film nut <laughs> and I love home movies yeah. and the way they reveal, but your dad, you know, your adoptive dad, um, Arnold, he had a good eye, you know? He really, really did. But one of the things, you know, in, in watching it again, just seeing the subtlety of this, the, the deeper layers of meaning, well, you know, one of them is your adoptive family. There are so many values encased in that, you know? Um, the dolls they gave you, the Caucasian or the, the white dolls to play with from the word go, you know? And I know they weren't thinking deeply about, and there weren't, there weren't any other kind of dolls that they could have purchased at any rate. But then hearing, you know, in your narration, being able to say you were reinventing yourself to their image, their smile, their way of being. Yeah. Um, I think in the first film, I, 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 we don't have the time or depth to do these full exploration, but I know you've sent me some articles you know, people have written whole chapters and books about first person plural. So it's real, there's, this is a rich, rich film to talk about identity. But one of the things I think um, uh, is amazing um, in it is, is how in that first film in particular, I think, in some ways we're, in retrospect now, I'm somewhat critical of, a, of an adoptive family that doesn't do the deeper work to sort of say, you know, what is the culture, particularly for an older child, you know, for a child who's eight? Mm -hmm. well, what, what did that, uh, what were those child's needs for emotional connection? You know, and I could have wished more. And, and I think the interviews with your uh, brother and sister, with Duncan in particular, they're very revealing, you know, they're very honest. And now in retrospect, and in, in light of the conversations we're having today, you know, one, one in a way would have hoped for something different for you. But I want to, uh, there's a question here I should ask you, but I wanted to jump. In the matter of Cha Jung Hing, something wonderful else happens where you, where you gain further insight into the ways in which they were probably trying to protect you at the same time as mm -hmm. keeping you back from reclaiming the memory. But one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe that some of our listeners have picked up on is behind the scenes, behind and not in the film, you know, did did the whole process of, of first person plural coming out, and, and I remembered seeing your adoptive family at the premiere at CAM, at, at uh, the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival. Did, mm -hmm. that, did that change their sort of views? Did, did they gain different kind of insights about the adoptive process? Did Duncan change or did he st still feel like it didn't matter, you're my sister and that's all that matters and America's the greatest country on the earth? Very much the same. Uh, you know, my parents, my family did come to the premiere. They came to Sundance and um, to the CAM premiere. Um, it was a really interesting experience, I have to say. Um, you know, my, well, just a quick note about my father's home movies. He, um, he actually got his first eight millimeter Bolex 
film camera in 1950 and started documenting the family. And he was such a, you know, it was, it was kind of a fad at the time. You know, people got these film cameras and had their editing machines and so on. And um, we, he would teach me how to edit the little then eight millimeter film. And, um, you know, I would operate the projector and we would watch the movies that he had created together. So, and he, he did um, just remarkable, he would kind of manipulate the family in remarkable ways. Like when we went on a vacation, you know, we'd all pile in the car and then he would film us driving away, um, but then we'd have to come back and pick him up because he had, you know, he wanted the shot. Of, and then when we arrived at whatever vacation, Disneyland or whatever, he wanted us arriving. So we'd drop him off at the gate, drive away, and then um, he would film us driving into the resort. So, you know, stuff like that was just part of kind of our regular um, family. And um, I think that he was, um, he, 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 I think he missed his, his calling, really. I think he should have been a cinematographer. But, he, you know, he, when he watched the movies in the film, I think he was um, particularly delighted to see his work um, and fascinated by the way that um, the film, that his film had been integrated into this larger story. And um, when we, I, I didn't actually show the film to them until it was, I think it was at a fine cut because I didn't want to show them anything that was, um, you know, half baked or that might not be in the film. Um, so at, when it was at the fine cut, we watched it together in the living room and it was the most fascinating conversation, a lot of tears and a lot of recognition. And I think their participation in the making of the film really um, helped. I know it certainly helped me heal. I think it really helped our family um, bring into the open um, things that happened in terms of the adoption, the secrets and lies, essentially, that were kind of the foundation of our relationship and exposed them and gave us a language to talk about. Um, and it gave us a reason, really, to talk about them. And um, yeah, it was it was an extraordinary. I think they were really brave to take on that um, take on that process. Yeah, thank you. That is remarkable. Yeah, and if we could, and and uh, let's take a look at a couple of the stills from uh, our images from in the matter of Cha Jung Hee. I wanted us to just remind our viewers. Um, yeah, the three Cha Jung He's, that photo on the left, the shoes, uh, yes, okay. So one of the things that becomes very interesting in a way is you're furthering this story, your, your deeper understanding of, you know, what might have happened to Cha Jung He, the, the notion that you were living someone else's life and you go on this journey to find her. Remarkable film, and in some ways, you know, I remember during the production of it, uh, you, you know, it was, I mean, you truly didn't know what you were going to find, and it becomes a, you know, right, an issue. How do you, what, what, it, what you complete? I think the most amazing thing happens when, when we, when, when you discover the one we believe is actually the first, but that we figure out there are three Japanese, right? right, and why, why there was this other photograph always. Uh, that is the most remarkable thing. And then this deeper revelation. This is almost like, um, it's like Chan is missing, you know, another fo formational Asian American film in which, and there, there's that symbolism that, that maybe there isn't, may, maybe there isn't one Cha Jung Hee that you can't find. Maybe it's a stand in, right? And I think that's what propels us towards even geographies of kinship, uh, the third one, which is that that your experience is, is a piece of a whole of, of what might have happened, you know? Had you stayed in Korea? Uh, had you gone to another country? Mm -hmm. uh, I just, really wouldn't have been to France. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you know, the whole idea of um, kind of a template or a child as a stand-in for any other child, I think that is such a common occurrence in, in adoption and um, the, this idea that I could have been any child. And my parents really didn't care what child they got. They wanted a, they were, wanted a child. And, um, you know, they had the evidence of these, actually three, three Cha Jung He's. And to them, it didn't really register that they were different girls and it didn't really matter. Um, I, I think that 
idea of um, just being a template for um, an idea um, is something that you know I tried to explore in the film. Yeah, and I know one of the aspects of this work that you've done, uh, you have become in so many ways uh, an important international spokesperson, uh, uniting you know people of the Korean diaspora and uh, speaking very much to open adoption principles. Is there something, anything that you'd like to share with us about, uh, you know, where, where, where the whole international movement and understanding is and trying to appreciate the complexities uh, of taking care of adopted kids and raising them properly or, or not properly, but, but to the most healthy way psychologically, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I just recently participated in a, um, an event called a, the First International Adoption Truth Day. Uh, the adoptee community in Korea for many years in conjunction with the birth mother movement and um, also first families in Korea um, had put together a, a conf an annual conference that, that essentially promoted the idea of um, single mothers. So it was called Single Mother's Day. And that went on for, I think, nine years. And um, they just recently uh, decided that um, that would you know, change now to this idea of adoption truths. And I think it's a really fascinating um, concept and movement in terms of uh, adoption, adoptees uh, beginning to acknowledge that, um, that it's time to actually look at not just adopt, adoption as um, something to be celebrated that we that brought joy and you know families together, but also that um, the mechanisms by which adoptions took place. There were a lot of um, uh, uh, forged documents or children that were s switched, or um, a lot of stories of you know uh, reports of parents who had um, who were dead, who weren't dead, or parents who were not married, who were married, or you know. Um, so I think those kinds of things um, are, are currently uh, coming forth in terms of um, the adoptee community trying to have some kind of reckoning around what happened to the 200,000 children and not to mention the, the birth mothers and their extended families. Um, that to me, I think it's, a, it's an exciting moment um, to reflect on um, the possibility to uh, reckon with both the South Korean state and um, adoptees and, and birth families and adoptive parents as well. Yeah, thank you. Good. Well, we have to, unfortunately, we have to keep marching forward. And I did want to remind folks that if you want you to prepare your questions, uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, shortly move into Q&A from our, our audience today. But I did want to turn now to memory of forgotten war and um, and I see it as your journey as a storyteller and a filmmaker that you're looking, you were, you were looking for always this broader context, you know, for, for with it, within which to place your life and your sense of family and community, you know, all of these rungs as they move up. And I think, uh, and I think it's what makes your body of work so profound is that there is this deeper connection. So I know in one sense, um, that project go out of a partnership with Ramsey Lim, who is um, who was also a former NATA board member. And for those of you who are new to us, we we also have two identities. As organizationally, we were NATA, the National Association of Asian American. I'm sorry, the National Asian American Telecommunications Association. <sighs> And uh, then in 2005, changed our name to Center for Asian American Media. And just in trying to say the name, I think that's, you have all the justification you need to understand of why we needed to change the name because it was impossible to say. Uh, we used to get uh, 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 chided by Ben Fong Torres every year when he would MC opening night <laughs> and he would make fun of the name. Um, anyway, um, I know Ramsey and, and the family, the Lim family is a very important one in, in the Korean American community and, and for reunification. And, I, and one of the things uh, that I picked up out of the, uh, out of the film is that, is that the, the viewpoint of, of the, 
it seems to me the bulk of, of uh, or the voice you never hear about the experience of Korean War is from the Korean people. And, and in this country, the stories that we tell are always about, you know, it's, it's crazy to think about, about, um, about Inchon or, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's always from this American, I mean, the invasion and, and Douglas MacArthur and, you know, it's, it's, it's something else. But for the Korean people, this, this uh, unresolved heartache to be one country. And I think, I think we understand, and we've come so close over these decades, you know, in moments of opening up and reunification. And I know you're working on another film about that very topic called The Crossing. Um, but, but, but if we could uh, talk a little bit about, well, the one thing I wanna talk to you about is, is, is this, it, do I have the, a wrong impression or does it seem that, you, that in this period around, you know, 2000, that you, you know, you were increasingly coming into uh, forming a community of artists and 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 uh, creative people. You did an exhibition in conjunction with this film. I remember it was remarkable. But there's a flowering of this next generation, I think, of of Korean Americans who are reclaiming and wanting to understand. And I think, I think your work started to blend and move in that direction too. Was is that is am I getting am I overstating it or is there something? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Memory of Forgotten War was actually. Um, started and inspired by Ramsey's work. Um, he was a, um, a, a, a faculty at um, Boston College, and he had been doing oral histories of Korean War survivors, both um, on the East Coast and West Coast. And at a certain point, he started sharing um, these oral histories um, with me. And you'll see actually the key, two of the key characters in the film um, uh, in these photos. And um, I was just struck so struck by these stories because you're absolutely right. You know, the Korean War is often narrated um, from the point of view of the military um, or um, the you know soldiers who fought in the war, but not we rarely hear from the people who um, both you know lived through and survived the war, or from those whose lives are very much shaped by the war's legacies, including you know younger generations who feel haunted by this history that um, is often not talked about and in this country is considered the forgotten war. Um, so I think that, um, you know, Ramsey's oral history work and um, the, the both the, oh, so when um, Ramsey actually, we started with um, this exhibit called Still Present Past, Memories of the Forgotten War. And it traveled, it was an exhibit that combined oral histories with artwork from a variety of different um, Korean and Korean American artists. And that traveled around um, to different cities. And then he and I started talking about doing something that would um, provide a larger platform for getting these stories out to the public with the idea of you, you know, eventually um, getting the film onto PBS. And so that's how we um, ended up producing Memory Forgotten War together. And it's a, it's a film that you know, follows four Korean American um, war survivors who each um, are separated families, who each have families in the North. And um, by one way or another, they eventually managed to go to North Korea and reunite with them. And I think the story of reunion is, um, you know, it both shows kind of the heartache of um, what it means to be divided for so many years and to, um, to have family members in the North who one has to um, consider the enemy. Um, what does that do to uh, not only a person, um, but a whole nation. And uh, I think there are profound questions that also, um, uh, you know, uh, that implicate the United States to a great extent, um, because the United States continues to have a, such a major um, role in, 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 the, in Korea and uh, could be such a um, key player in helping to resolve the war. Yeah. Yes, and that's a huge reminder. You know, for that project, I know I know it's still accessible and still a website that uh, we can share the information in the chat. Did you want to? Uh, are you still contributing to? And and forgive me, the name escaped me right now. What's the what? Well, so so following Memory Forgotten War, we actually with um, Ramsey along with Professor Christine Hong, Ji Yanya, um, J T Takagi, um, and uh, a number of other folks, Elaine Kim. 
um, we put together a, a website called um, Memory, uh, Legacies of the Korean War. So if you go to www.legaciesofthekoreanwar.org, you can see some uh, wonderful vid short videos of people's lives, um, first person stories, both from survivors as well as second generation, um, younger, younger Korean Americans who are reflecting on um, issues around you know, what it means to kind of carry this burden of the unfinished war in their own lives. Great. Okay, so now uh, we're going to turn to some questions from the audience, uh, from, from our uh, listeners, viewers, I guess we would say. Uh, let me try one here from uh, Hao Tian Shu. With the emergence of streamers such as Netflix and Hulu, do you think we are now in a better place to tell and distribute documentaries and stories about the Asian American experience? Or do you fear that our stories can get crowded out by the pure abundance of media today. Oh, that's a good. That's a question you should answer, Stephen. What do you think you're the in, in the midst of all of this? Let's turn this around. <laughs> well, I'll just say from from my end, both as a filmmaker and as a consumer. And as a consumer, um, you know, it's a really interesting time to access films. You know, to be able to watch. Um, Bao Nguyen's film "Be Water" on on um, e, uh, ESPN. Um, and then to catch films on, I think I watched um, Ramona Diaz's film on, was it Amazon Prime or Hulu? Um, so, you know, having all of these diverse, um, diverse platforms deliver Asian American media is um, pretty in incredible to me. Um, I think that uh, I still rely on PBS uh, and CAM <laughs> um, to um, watch a lot of films, um, but I think, I think you'd probably have a better answer to this in terms of what you anticipate. Thank, well, I think we're, I, I, I think your viewpoint is, is, is the key one as a filmmaker, you know, and wanting to get your story out. And I think uh, for me, and let's tie it to this day, you know, this time or the, the moment we're in, right, of, uh, of reckoning and an understanding that in some ways, so much of our society has been forced through a, this mainstream lens, and it's a partic there are particular kinds of gatekeepers in that. And I think you know what we always tried to do, right, from the beginning, was say, you know what, um, we don't want to just beat our heads against that wall and try to make the case that people are interested in our stories. We're going to just tell our stories, and then we're going to then they'll find that audience. And I think. I think that we've borne that one out. So I would hate to give up this 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 space, uh, and yet, you know, that there are possibilities for for uh, our creative filmmakers to work in in every kind of medium, in every kind of distribution channel. Absolutely, tell every kind of story under the sun. Uh, my my personal taste is the more more personal, the deeper, and that's why. I guess I chose your work <laughs> to, to feature today. Let's go to another question. As a fellow uh, KAD, which I would guess Korean American diaspora filmmaker, how have you felt at times both support by and isolated from the Asian American filmmaking community? What specific films that aren't necessarily Asian American adoptee focused inspire you? Yeah, what type of films? And I would just add parenthetically, I know you've all, you've you've helped a number of other films along, like Breathing, the Eddie Zhang story, and um, uh, the, the Comfort Women one. That, that the also, Apology, yeah. The Apology, yeah. So, but anyway, tell us about yeah, your view of, of uh, Asian American films writ large. What attracts you to tell a story? What, where, where does that fit in with, with the projects you'd like to work on? Well, first, CAD means Korean adoptee. Oh. <laughs> so I assume that that's a Korean adoptee that asked that question. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think, well, first, just to respond to that question, um, you know, there, there is a conversation among the adoptee community about whether Korean adoptees are Asian American or, or not, and whether even adoptive families who have an Asian child are Asian American um, or not. And I think that um, when I first joined CAM, um, you know, I was very much uh, wondering that myself, you know, um, what does it mean to be, because I grew up thinking I was white and in an all white family. And um, I really had to go through a process of 
um, re-educating myself and, and kind of this process of decolonization, both of my mind and of my body and views of aesthetics, um, everything. And um, I think because of the work that we were doing at CAM in terms of supporting Asian American media and the stories that we were focusing on at the time, which were um, you know, initially stories about the Japanese internment um, and uh, uh, Chinese American experience primarily, <laughs> um, but but watching those films um, really helped me see that I, my own experience as a Korean adoptee in a white family, as an Asian person growing up in a white family, is an Asian American experience, and um, and I think that uh, it took me a while to understand that um, I am both Korean American and Asian American. It seems it would it. It's sort of an obvious, it seems like an obvious thing, but it's really not for a person who grew up very racially isolated um, without any kind of, you know, exposure to Asian culture or Asian American culture or history. Um, it was a profound turning point um, in my understanding of myself and my own history to situate Korean adoptees experience as an Asian American experience. And, you know, frankly, Asian American studies, I think it take, it's taken a while for even Asian American studies to consider Korean adoptees or Asian adoptees as part of the Asian American community. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers that person's question, but in terms of the films, um, whether adopted or not, I mean, I think that um, when I was first making First Person Plural, I was, of course, looked at the films that were available um, at, at Cam, um, including films like um, Sewing Woman by Arthur Dong, a, a wonderful film about his mother, um, beautifully shot, uh, and Felicia Lowe's China, Land of My Father, where she returns to China. Um, I think uh, Rhea Tajiri's film, History and Memory, um, which explores the, um, her family's experience during the internment. Um, it's a beautiful personal essay film that also kind of interrogates the whole way in which the Japanese internment and the bombing of Pearl Harbor is constructed in U.S. collective memory. Um, it combines both her personal voice and her family's recollections or non-recollections with um, footage, you know, shot by Japanese um, pilots and American soldiers and U.S. Uh, commercial Hollywood films, um, so it was. It's it was that that was a, a really memorable film that I've watched a number of times. Um, there are also films like um, uh, Ruth Ozeki's *Halving the Bones*. I don't know if you remember that film, but Ruth Ozeki, she made that film and then she went on to become a novelist. Um, but that film was just also a, a wonderful exploration of her personal. Um, experience as as a mixed race um, uh, woman um, and her family. Um, so I, I feel like the the early Asian American films really impacted uh, the development of my own voice and my interests. Um, and and um, yeah, does that answer? And then, yes, it does. I want to thank Leah Nichols for posing the question. Um, I think it does, and I think it's wonderful that you have shared your your experience, your expertise at independent filmmaking, you know, to help launch new filmmakers and new new ideas. I wonder, you know, um, we we I talked at the beginning about Camp Forward and what that means, and 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 not wanting our anniversary year just to be looking backwards, but looking to the future for you. I know you you've got several films you're working on. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give you space to mention those, but also maybe a larger one if you want to venture there too. You know, is there anything that th this current kind of incredible multiple crises at once have? Is it given? Has it changed, altered in any way the way that you're seeing? The, you know, the next few years uh, for your work. Is it? Would it alter it in any way? Are you hoping we get back to normal? Are you seeing? Are you seeing opportunities or do we just want to hunker down and get through it? What are you looking at? Yeah. Well, um, first, the, the film that I'm working on that you mentioned, actually, I'm working on two films. Um, one is called Crossings, which is about um, a group of um, women peace activists who go to North Korea and cross the DMZ into South Korea. Um, 
as a uh, way of drawing attention to the unended Korean War and the need for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And the group includes, um, it, the group is led by a Korean American activist named Christine Ahn and includes um, two Nobel laureates, uh, uh, Leima Bowie from Liberia and Mairead McGuire from Northern Ireland, as well as uh, Gloria Steinem and um, Medea Benjamin, Abby Disney, and a variety of other people from around the world. And um, so the film, you know, follows um, the, the women's arrival in North Korea and their uh, various attempts to strategize on how, they're, how and where they're gonna cross the DMZ. And, um, kind of uh, thinking strategically about challenging this, the DMZ as a fixed border. Um, and I think it's also, I'm discovering as I, the more I work on the film, um, I think the, a key part of the film is actually um, about the consequences of engaging with North Korea as this pariah state. And um, North Korea being the most vilified nation in the world, um, what's at stake for these women as they promote engagement and dialogue with a nation um, that uh, is so fixed in the American psyche as being fundamentally evil. Um, so it, it's a really challenging film and I'm really looking forward to finishing it, uh, which hopefully, you know, will be toward the end of this year. Um, I'm also working on a film called, um, the working title is Relative Strangers. Um, it uh, continues my uh, obsession with uh, transnational adoption and it follows a group of um, mixed race, first generation mixed race um, Korean adoptees who um, go to Korea to um, search out their um, biological uh, Korean family um, and then um, also return home, um, take DNA tests and to, as, as a way of um, trying to discover their American um, father's family uh, who were soldiers and stationed in the US. So it's a, it's a project that, um, explores, it's, it's unfolding in the present day, but it's definitely speaking to kind of the legacies of militarism, um, the, the, the impact of US military presence in South Korea and the way in which the military camp towns um, were um, provided opportunities for US soldiers and Korean um, civilians to interact and the very intimate ways in which um, the US and, and Korea are connected. Uh, so I'm, that is in development, and um, I'm hoping to um, concentrate on that next year. Um, in terms of, you know, the current moment, um, because of not leaving my house much, I've really enjoyed taking in um, these webinars from, I mean, Cam has done some really wonderful things that I've watched, enjoyed online. Firelight Media has done some really great um, discussions. Um, I think this whole question about equity and inclusion is really exciting. Um, the development of uh, Asian American Documentary Network, ADOC, and um, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, uh, the amazing activism and support that they're providing, you know, for young filmmakers and the young filmmakers themselves. Um, you know, I recently looked at um, uh, trailers for um, Vicky Du's new film. Looks amazing about intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, there's so many young uh, filmmakers that are are exploring both our history and their own lives, and looking forward. And it, it, I just find that really um, inspiring. And uh, it just kicks me in the butt to to watch the new work and and just get really excited about um, both the potential of of, of the kinds of stories they're telling and also inspires me to you know do my best and um continue to you know talk about things that i want to do <laughs> that is so wonderful thank you so much deanne um we're going to share i think in the in the chat um information on on how folks can still follow your work probably at moo film uh, like all independent filmmakers, your work needs support. And if any of our viewers out there uh, want to get more involved deeply with Deanne, please reach out. I know that she'd appreciate your help. Um, it's inspiring to talk to you. It is a deep, deep pleasure. We could go on and on. For some reason, 
we have we've set on a new length i think of expectation that we try to do everything within an hour and not have it go on but um but i look forward to being able to see you again in person and hang out you know and have some good meals together um so that it's not just a trilogy of korean american adoptee films it will soon be a, a quatrology or whatever we call that and I've got a feeling you're not going to stop there. I think this is going to keep going on and it'll be may, it may. Yeah. a richness in the future that we can. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you us. very much. Thank you for having me. Take care. Be safe and well. Okay. Take care. Thank you. So uh, we're going to say goodbye to Deanne and uh, we've got a little bit of fun now ahead of us. I'm going to turn this back over to Jen and who's going to do a little bit of a giveaway, I think. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Dan and Stephen. And yeah, as Stephen mentioned, uh, now we're really thrilled to present a random giveaway featuring uh, one ticket each to our Camp Fest Forward opening night presentation and our Camp Fest Forward closing night presentation. We've randomly selected a winner from all of you in attendance today, and I will share that name in just a second. So. Uh, please. And the winner is Virginia Yee. If Virginia is here, uh, congratulations. Uh, and I will follow up with you following today's program to let you know how you can um, activate your ticket. Okay, great. Well, um, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Stephen to close us out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, and thank you for um, all that you do in supporting CAM. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, if you enjoyed the program, drop us a line. Let us know how you feel about it. We've recorded it uh, just in case. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, De Deanne has been so generous through this to share her films and let anybody watch them. Um, I've got a feeling she wouldn't mind at all if uh, you share the links and uh, and with your with your family, you know, with your young ones in particular. If you've got teenagers, we want young people to see these films and understand their 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 history. Um, and uh, and then if they'd like, they can they can take a look at the conversation uh, recording and uh, get some further insights from Deanne. So I hope to see you um, uh, all joining us for CAMFest Forward and for, uh, we're gonna have a, a wrap up at the end of the year in November, um, celebrating CAMFest and our 40, 40 years of work. And I hope uh, we can count on seeing you join us for that. So on behalf of all of us at CAM, thank you. Have a, a safe and enjoyable uh, rest of the year or, rest of this weekend at least. Let's hope the air clears up and we enjoy uh, uh, being able to go outdoors again. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye.